Okay, so we looked at some pedigrees before. So a couple of things we have to know. This wants us to identify the inheritance pattern. So first of all, you can identify if it's dominant or recessive by looking at the generations. If it shows in every generation, it is likely a dominant trait. If it skips a generation, like this one does here, it skips generation two, it is a recessive trait, right? When we did the Mendel experiment, you had purple and white flowers and they came together and made only purple flowers. So the white disappeared and when you bred the purple flowers again, you got the white and purple back. So the fact that the purple flower comes back makes it a recessive trait. And we know that it's recessive because it skips that generation right there, okay? So first of all, I can look at this and I can say, this is a recessive trait. I can also look at the gender that is affected. If males are affected more than females or females are affected more than males, then it's a sex linked trait of one form or another. If it appears to show equally in both genders, then it would be an autosomal trait, chromosomes one through 22, okay? So this clearly, it only affects the males. So that's gonna make this a sex-linked trait. So it's sex-linked recessive. If it was more common in females, it would be sex-linked dominant. The fact that this daughter's dad has it, but she doesn't means that she's hiding that allele from dad. So that makes it recessive. If it was dominant, dad's X would be expressed in her. Okay, which of the statements is not true of the female in generation two? So this is generation two. So what do I know? I know she does not show the trait, but she is carrying the trait. She inherited it from dad. Her son has it. So that makes her a carrier. Um, so she is a carrier of the condition, letter A. I could also say that she inherited the allele from her father because he has the trait and now she hides it. So A and D are both true. Number three, which of the following is true regarding the third generation? So I see the third generation has two boys, two girls, four total. One, the youngest, because you go oldest to youngest, left to right, the youngest has the trait and the oldest does not. So which of the following is true? Individual four inherited the condition from his dad. No, he has it, dad doesn't. And if it's sex linked, he's not getting dad's ex, only the daughters are. The females have a 50% chance of being a carrier for this condition. Mom has two exes, one has the allele and one doesn't, right? 50-50 chance, they will get mom's recessive allele. So that would be true. Females have a 50% chance of being carriers for the condition. They cannot be affected because they would need two recessive alleles. And males, we see that there's one out of two. So clearly it's not a 100% chance that the males are going to get it. So in number three, we just have um, the individual four inherited the condition from, no, females have a 50% chance. Okay, in the true or false, autosomal dominant means gender, same, male and females affected, dominant every generation. So if the offspring shows a trait, one of the parents must show the trait as well. So if it's a dominant trait and you're getting that genetic, that gene from a parent, obviously the parent had the dominant trait as well, so the parent would show the traits, so that's true. A man with normal vision, um, Marries a woman who's normal, but they have a colorblind, she has a colorblind father. So she's a carrier. So let me get um, a quick drawing tool out for this one. So mom, I'm gonna use N for normal, normal vision. Her dad had the recessive allele. So she is heterozygous. The man was normal. So he's got a normal and the Y doesn't get anything, right? So if I can bring her normal allele down and here's her recessive allele, it's hard to draw. And I got some box, woo. 
Okay, so these two are going to be dominant. These, this one's going to be dominant. So both of those are going to show the dominant trait. And this one is going to be heterozygous. So half and half. And this one is going to show the colorblind trait because they get the one recessive allele. So 25%, one out of four. That's true as well. And it would be a male because of the Y. So both of these are true. Okay. Any questions on any of those? Good. So you are ready to turn that in, and that is the only thing you need to turn in today. Because today I talk a lot, and so there won't be time for you to do work. So today I am going to talk about genetic disorders. Tomorrow you are working on a karyotype, um, which we're going to talk about today. You're going to work on a karyotype gizmo. And then um, Friday, we have our test over chapter 11. So that review has already been posted if you wanted to get started on that early. Before I go, I wanted to point out two common mistakes people made on one of the worksheets you guys did. So this, um, this is that sex link trait you guys did. So I just wanna point out a couple um, common mistakes that people made. So um, in this case, I have a female who's a carrier. So she has one dominant, one recessive, um, and she marries a normal male. So he has the normal H allele. So when I bring this over, distribute that to each of those. I'm gonna bring this over, distribute that to each of those. This person is homozygous dominant. This one is heterozygous, therefore a carrier. This one is a normal male, and this one is a colorblind male. So what is the probability that their children in general, their children will have hemophilia? <clears throat> so I'm gonna look at the whole square to determine that answer. And I see only one in four will have hemophilia. So either one in four or 25%. The number one is not a chance, a probability, okay? You'd need to be one in four or 25% chance. So this is where people made a common mistake. What is the probability that their son, so once it says their son, I'm already limiting it to these answers or this side of the box. So what's the chance their son already born will have hemophilia? So one in two chance or 50%. I got a lot of 25% chances on this one, um, which you only have two that you're looking at. So you can't have a 25% chance. The same sort of mistake happened on this slide here. So again, bring over the recessive alleles. This time mom has the dis disorder. Dad gives a dominant allele. So neither of the girls have hemophilia, but they're both carriers. And then whatever's on the X will be expressed in the males. So both males will have the disorder. So what percent of their sons, so once again, we're limiting to their sons, will have the disorder? Two out of two, so that's 100% chance of having the trait. Females, 0%. Any questions on, whoops. Sorry. Any questions on those two commonly missed questions? So today we're gonna to talk about genetic disorders characteristics and how they're passed on. First, does anybody have any family history of genetic disorders that they know of? Any cousins, aunts, uncles? After we go through this, you might wanna go through it again or maybe do it while you're taking notes today. Um, you're gonna to wanna to categorize these. So on the review sheet, I say which traits are um, sex link dominant, sex link recessive, autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive. So you might make columns or rows where you're keeping track of the disorders that are dominant, recessive, autosomal, sex link, non-disjunction, okay? So that you might just wanna organize your thoughts. Okay, so genetic testing can happen in a couple ways. Obviously, we could take your DNA and test it um, and look for some genetic markers. But they also can find a no number of disorders simply by extracting um, amniotic fluid 
from the um, placental sac here that the baby is in, draw out some of that amniotic fluid. This is called amniocentesis. As the cells are going through mitosis, we know that the chromosomes become visible, right? So it kind of freeze frames them in one state of mitosis where they have paired up with their sisters and um, they arrange them in what's called a karyotype. So a karyotype arranges them longest to shortest. Chromosomes one through 22, you need to know are your autosomes. They code for all kinds of traits and affect males and females the same. Number 23 is your X and Y chromosome. So if they match, it's an X. If they don't match, one of them is a Y. So in your gizmo tomorrow, you're going to create an amniocentesis, determine the gender of an offspring. You can also determine certain disorders if there are too many chromosomes or there are not enough chromosomes. You can determine some other disorders that I'm not getting into by pieces being deleted or inserted onto another chromosome entirely. Okay, so basically this is a picture of the chromosomes in the cell. So non-disjunction is one of those disorders that you can identify from a karyotype. It's when one cell gets too many chromosomes and the other cell gets not enough. So this is, remember, meiosis. We're dividing cells, homologs separate in anaphase one, sisters separate in anaphase two. So sometimes they don't separate, non-disjoined, non-separated. Um, so this is the most um, lethal of your disorders and that many of the non-disjunction disorders, individuals will never come to terms. So there's only a handful of non-disjunctions that, that do come to term and then the baby is born. Um, and so we're very familiar with those that survive, okay? So um, one cell gets not enough, the other cell gets too many. The other type of disorders we'll talk about come from mutations. So the genetic code um, gets changed in some way. So this is showing non-disjunction. Um, this is a chromosome set during metaphase, metaphase one, because they're still with their sisters and their homologs. Then when they separate, each daughter cell should get four, right? But here I can see this pair here did not separate. This cell got five, that's too many. This cell got enough, that's, this cell got one less, which is not enough, okay? So this one would end up with something called trisomy number two. This one would be aneuploid, A is not or without. It doesn't have a chromosome at all. So trisomy is when you get three of one chromosome. Um, this happens more often in older females. So after the age of 40, your chance of having chromosomal abnormalities increases. Remember, we're born with all the eggs we will ever have. And so your eggs at 40 years have experienced a lot of environmental mutagens, possibly x-rays, things like that. And so um, there's a lot of opportunity for chromosomal damage. So the older you are, um, the greater your chance. Here you can see this chromosome has one too many. This is trisomy one, two, three, trisomy 21. And this is a boy, has an X and a Y. So trisom trisomy 21 is more commonly known as Down syndrome. So you probably recognize the characteristic face of a Down syndrome child. So this happens when they get too many of the 21st chromosome. Um, individuals will have that flattened face, almond eyes, a thick tongue, show a degree of mental retardation, short in stature, thin hair, and are at risk for some cardiac heart related problems, leukemia, cataracts, digestive blockages, okay? So because you're all getting the same extra chromosome, it would make sense since each chromosome codes for specific traits, it would make sense that they have similar traits, right? Okay, um, here is a, another non-disjunction. In this case, two X's failed to separate. So you end up with an XXY. 
Y. So the XXY is a male because of the Y chromosome. And this is called Kleinfelter syndrome. So if you've ever seen a male calico cat, that would be a cat with Kleinfelters. Um, what happens because it's on those sex chromosomes, you're going to have sex-related um, traits. So it's reduced sexual maturity, secondary sexual characteristics, such as breast swelling and no sperm production. Turner syndrome is kind of the opposite. Instead of getting one too many and getting, being a boy, you get one not enough and you're a girl. So here we can see the single X chromosome. This is called Turner syndrome. This individual is often infertile, sexually underdeveloped, short in stature, um, has a narrow aorta, which is the biggest of your arteries, and normal intelligence. Triple X syndrome does affect the IQ. So now we have three of the X's. Also, um, obviously female, because there's no Y, it would also affect menstrual irregularities. Jacob syndrome is, he has three of the 21st chromosomes, but two Y's. So the sister chromatids of the Y failed to separate. So most of the people that have Jacob syndrome show no abnormalities. So you wouldn't even know that they had Jacob syndrome. Okay, so um, Jacob syndrome, interesting enough um, is that there's a disproportionate number of individuals that are incarcerated with Jacob syndrome. So um, that might just be because more like they test, get all of your tests done if you're in jail. And so maybe they just recognize it more often. Um, so that's all of the ones that are non-disjunction where there's a failure of chromosomes to separate. So those all stick together in one category. Now we're going into autosomal. So they affect males and females the same and um, <clears throat> recessive. So it skips a generation. I'm not gonna ask you statistics, knowing like the major characteristic is possible, knowing how it's passed on is definite, okay? So uh, cystic fibrosis, you might've seen the movie Six Feet, right? They, the two cystic fibrosis patients had to stay six feet apart at all times because they have a buildup of thick mucus in their lungs and mucus is sticky, which traps bacteria. And so they have a lot more bacterial infections um, that interfere with their breathing abilities. Um, so they have to have normal breathing treatments, a um, couple different types of treatments they could do. And this is really the most common lethal genetic disorder. So look at the numbers, one in 25 is a carrier and one in 2,500 has the disorder. So that is not uncommon at all. We've had a couple of cystic fibrosis kids in the same class or school before the same year, and we had to separate them. Um, we had to make sure their, their schedules made it so that they did not cross paths or weren't in the same classroom at the same time. So going on, again, this category is all autosomal recessive. We've seen albinism, right? We know that they don't have coloring in the hair and the skin and the eyes. So very susceptible to sun damage. Um, Ty Sachs disease, we did a pedigree just the other day. So Ty Sachs disease, autosomal recessive, comes from a fatty buildup in the brain during development. So um, these children do not live very long because that fatty buildup in the brain would affect the neurons, which are the nerve cells. And so it makes it so that they cannot function very well. So this is a normal brain on top, and this is a tie sac brain here. Um, so we can see the white stuff is the fat. So there's a lot of fatty tissue there. It is more common in certain areas, and this is just from historical background because it makes you, um, if you're heterozygous, you're resistant to tuberculosis. So areas where tuberculosis may have been more prevalent makes it more common in a certain population. Continuing on with autosomal recessive, PKU, phenylketonuria, urea is urine. So this is affecting your, break, your ability to break down phenylalanine. 
uric acid. Um, this also leads to mental retardation and possible death. You are born, like as soon as you're born, they test you for PKU. So they do a little foot prick, they draw your blood because you can hold the, the characteristics off by putting um, children on a special diet. Here's our alcaptonuria. This is normal urine. This is alcaptonuria urine. So clearly it creates this black urine due to an enzyme deficiency that causes acid to be secreted in the, um, in the urine. That acid can also build up in the bones and joints, which causes a lot of pain. And I think this is the last of my autosomal recessive disorders, galactosemia. So you might um, recognize galactose as similar to lactose. Some people are lactose intolerant. So galactosemia um, is when they can't break down the galactose that is found in dairy products. Sickle cell is kind of a co-dominant recessive disorder, right? So you can be recessive homozygous recessive and have the disease itself, which makes it so you can't um, transport your blood and oxygen all that well. It gets caught in your joints and vessels, um, creating pain, hemorrhaging, and anemia. We know the heterozygous version is co-dominant and therefore shows in both um, the normal cells and the sickle cells. Protects you from malaria. So here you can see under a microscope what the sickle cells look like, and then that they also have the normal cells. So that's the autosomal recess. Any questions so far? Okay, we have less to get through, but we still gotta get through it. So X-linked traits, we've already talked about these. They're found on the X chromosome. They're more common on males. Here's one um, that skips a generation. Here's a different version where um, if mom is a carrier and dad has the disorder, then the daughter would have it as well. So in order for the girl to have it, dad has to have it as well. So hemophilia, we have already worked with this one with a pedigree, delayed clotting of blood. So even a minor cut turns into life-threatening injuries. This is showing you like it has a tendency to um, pool, the blood pools inside and then it'll collect or gather in joints. So that would be characteristic of hemophilia. Muscular dystrophy is another sex-linked recessive trait. Muscles, dystrophy means um, a deterioration. So this has a deterioration in the muscles affecting boys at an early age, three to five years old, because you're losing all of your muscles, um, you progressively get weaker, you'll be in a wheelchair, poor balance, walking difficulties, and eventually have a young life expectancy um, because all of our organs are working because of muscles. So like breathing, for example, requires muscles. So if all of your muscles are deteriorating, here's a young boy, um, we can see not a lot of muscles on there, we can see through to his bones. So it's kind of like ALS, but ALS happens in an adult and muscular dystrophy shows up in young children. So another one, color blindness. If you had color blindness, you might not be able to see the number in any one of these circles. Red green color blindness is the most common. There's different versions. So these different colored circles would be used to identify different versions. In your eyes, in the very back of your eyes, you have the retina that contains cones cones are your color receptors. So if you had color blindness, certain cones would either not be present or would be um, not effective. So those were all sex-linked recessive disorders. Our last category is autosomal dominant. So any of the first 22 chromosomes, dominant um, shows up no matter what. Right, so poly, many, dactylism, digits. Extra fingers, extra toes. So this is pretty common in um, cats, actually, that they would have set six toes. So you can see this individual has six toes, this individual has six fingers. This is a good example where 
the most common trait is not necessarily the dominant trait, right? Because not very many people have six fingers or six toes. So it's not a common trait, but it's still a dominant allele. Achondroplasia is another one. So this is dwarfism. So when the arms and legs are um, comparatively short, so there's um, dwarfism and then there's midgets, and that has to do with whether the arms and legs are proportional or not. So they have a normal life expectancy. They just don't grow very tall. And it's kind of interesting because he's dominant, you only need one allele for this to show, right? So he could have a dominant allele and a recessive allele, pass a recessive allele onto his son or daughter, and they are normal height. So that would be really interesting, right? If you were like six foot tall and your dad was three foot eight. I think it's interesting. Huntington's disease is another um, autosomal dominant trait. So if your parent has it, there's a 50% chance that you're going to have it as well. Um, it doesn't show until later on in life. So by then, by the time these disorders show, you've already had children. So um, this affects the nervous system and the cells of the brain. So degeneration in these cells cause muscle jerking, slurring of speech, a loss of balance, um, and eventually in, incapacitation. So total, um, like everything that your brain controls. This one is affected by a mutation on chromosome number four where the, the DNA kind of stutters. So AGC is like three of the codes and it, it repeats AGC, 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 AGC. So too many, that repetition causes this disorder. So you can get a genetic um, test to determine if you have it. So like this is my cousins, Yvonne and Annette, and their dad had the um, Huntington's disease, which means they had a 50% chance of getting it. So Annette got tested and Yvonne did not. Annette does have or did have the Huntington's um, disease. So you saw a picture of all of us at her last birthday on um, one of the most recent worksheets you guys did. This is Annette at Central Park. Okay, so we need to go a little bit further into trying to figure out genotypes of pedigrees, but we're not going to do that today because I knew I was going to take up a lot of your time. Um, but we can determine the inheritance patterns, dominant, recessive, sex-linked, or autosomal by doing pedigrees, and, and that helps us trace the disorders, okay? So with that, that was a lot of content. Take some time to digest it. Try to create, um, you know, a category list of your different disorders. You don't have to know all of the details, just how it's passed on and maybe like a key characteristic, okay? So what questions do you have?